I'd like to start with a video from Stephen Hill. So Stephen is an archaeologist by background and a stroke survivor. He's a public contributor to the Bristol Health Partners Executive Group, as well as being a co-director of the Stroke Health Integration Team. He's also very actively involved in the Stroke Pathway Programme run by Healthier Together. And to add another role to his roll call, he's also a trustee of Bristol After Stroke. Now in Stephen's video, he's going to be sharing some reflections on a friend and her family's experience of treatment, and also his own experiences of online physio and how that's been for him. If any questions occur for Stephen, he's very happy to answer them later, so please do jot them down in the chat. Now I think we're ready to play the video, which lasts about eight minutes. Thanks very much. So I wonder if we might start then, Stephen, with um, your friend and, and her family's experience of treatment during COVID. Could you tell us a little bit about what aspects of that care worked well and, and what some of the challenges have been? Well, that's quite, quite difficult. She's still in hospital. She had a very deep brain hemorrhage and she's alive, but the, um, the situation is fairly grim still. So she's got aphasia. She's got a degree of paralysis on both sides. Now, for anyone to wake up as, as you do after a stroke eventually, that's a very frightening, panicky thing to happen. But what's clear is it's much worse in the COVID crisis because you can't have your family with you. No visitors unless they think you're about to die. And the staff are all in PPE and it's much more difficult to establish an interpersonal relationship with somebody that is as it were in armour. So I think that experience is pretty grim actually. Mm -hmm. Now she's in London and has been in the, in many ways, some of the very leading institutions for stroke rehab. Um, and some of the things they've done have been quite interesting. They, They've got a bank of tablets and the nurses are doing the best they possibly can to organise at least virtual face-to-face -face communication. And one of the things I thought was quite touching about all this was that um, they actually arranged for large blow-up printouts of pictures of close relatives and the grandchildren, which were put round her so that when she came out and started to surface, there were familiar faces, albeit on paper around her rather than real people. So that's been very good. But it's been also been very clear that she's starved of real human contact. And she's finding that more and more difficult as the weeks go by. And I, I think in a way that's the big thing. But also for the family, they can't be there with her. So they're feeling rather helpless. And with the best in the world, they're communicating with the staff who are supporting her indirectly by phone, not actually meeting them or anything like that. So the whole thing is a kind of remote process at a time of great personal anxiety and crisis. So and I, I can't see how else it could have been handled. But I think after the event, if it all calms down, there are going to be quite significant issues with mental health arising from the trauma that's been exacerbated, it seems to me, by the situation which applies for people in hospital. And I think another lesson that's come out of that, by the way, I might have said this later, is the need for integrated services. Mm. And my experience five years ago was that communication between social services and medical services was was haphazard and quite often accidental. Um, what's being relayed back to me is a desire to achieve that, but it, it's just not happening because everybody's working at home and the normal in interchange that would be going on between staff meeting each other isn't happening. And that means discussing the cases of individual patients is much more difficult. Absolutely. And one of those changes in interactions is the interaction that you've been having with, with your physio. I wonder if you might tell us a bit about that, Stephen, and how that yeah. experience has been. Well, that, that's been interesting. I didn't expect that physio by Zoom would be any good for man or beast. Actually, it's got advantages in some ways. 
Um, and there are some quite simple procedural advantages. Like I don't have to get myself to a clinic and arrive there exhausted. So that actually when we start a physio session, I'm much, if you like, much fitter than I would have been if I'd gone across the city and then manoeuvred myself into a, another building and all those sort of things, which, because I'm physically quite disabled, are stressful and are exhausting processes in their own right. So the physio is actually seeing me much fresher than she did before all this happened. Um, from her point of view, it's also been quite interesting. It's meant my Fiona, my wife, has had to be her hands in Zoom physio session. But what she's reporting back to me is, hey, hang on, this is really surprising. But she said, she said after one or two sessions, not just with me, but with other people as well, she was saying, I can actually see what's happening to and whether muscles are working or not working or how they're not working in ways that I don't normally, because I'm so hands-on that I'm concentrating on what I'm doing much more. So that being, as it were, a bystander, a third party, is enabling me to zoom in on things and I can move things around on the screen at my end to blow up what I need to see. So she was actually reporting, whilst she prefers proper face-to-face, -face, hands-on physio, Nevertheless, she's conceding that there are some advantages. And the other one that's come out, actually, is we've made a lot of use of recording things. And that means we can then have an interesting reflective discussion between us in ways we couldn't normally, because we can look back on what happened and say, ah, oh, did you notice that? And maybe we should try this again. And there's an unexpected outcome. We didn't think that was going to happen because we were concentrating on something else. So those sort of quite deep analytical conversations wouldn't have happened because no one was observing that sort of thing and there was no record of it. So, I mean, these are, I think, these messages to hang on to that we shouldn't lose. That's really helpful. And I wonder if you might be able to finish just with what your main message is to the health integration teams about those changes and, and, and what you think they should be keeping in mind over the coming months. Well, I don't think we should let go of distance relationships, dis distant therapies. I have no experience of aphasia. You can see I can talk. Uh, um, but it's been being reported back to me by people who do have aphasia that, again, the recording dimension of it's been useful because they're able to rerun a, a session. So I, I would say let's, let's be as positive as, as we can and say, we must never, never lose the advantages of accidents. They're all accidental benefits, unexpected outcomes, but nevertheless, they are outcomes. For the moment, they're, they're empirical observations with, if you like, the evidence base is a bit shaky, but that's something we need to collect more of because we are, I think we can accept as a kind of given that a lot of things will be worse, but Nevertheless, where, where things have been helpful, it's really important we can capture them. I think I've said already that when you, especially when you leave hospital, the integrated services would just make such an incredible difference. But that's not everybody's experience yet. It's an aspiration, I accept that. But I think we need to push that even further because if you're not getting the communication one-to-one -one with a, a therapist, or a nurse, or a doctor, or whatever it might be. It doesn't help when you also don't have your therapists not talking to the social, social people and the community-based people who's, who are absolutely vital to those issues of survival immediately after discharge from hospital. And I think we need to, we have been, it's something the stroke hit's been quite obsessive about, has been pushing for integrated services. But I think the COVID story has, really push that forward absolutely to the top of the agenda.